Richard, uh, welcome to our HFG night. And this evening we will look into series two of the lesson Victory Through Faith. And the lesson is about Joshua, and the title is As For Me and My House. Now I'm going to start this lesson by reading a story. You know, so if you're an MMA or boxing fans, you would enjoy this. And you're probably familiar with these stories as well. I never took the fight seriously. Those somber words of former heavyweight boxing champion Iron Mike Tyson came several weeks after arguably the greatest upset in the history of professional boxing. Around 30,000 fans cramped into the Tokyo Dome. The bell clanked and two hawking men began to pummel each other. The crowd anticipated Tyson to fight a resounding defeat of a relatively unknown boxer named James Buster Douglas. As the rounds added up, the crowd and critics realized something was wrong. In the 10th round, a relatively unknown Buster Douglas defeated a battered and staggering Iron Mike by knockout. After he knocked Tyson to the canvas for the first time in Tyson's storied career, the boxing world was stunned, but the defeated heavyweight champion realized it was his own fault. I was out of shape, more or less, Tyson said in the New York Times articles in March 1990. I let myself get too heavy before the fight. I lost 25 pounds in Japan in the last month before the fight. It was too much. I fell into sloppy habits. Douglas beat an out-of-shape guy who did not prepare properly. Now, Mike Tyson's defeat teaches us a little about human nature. Over time, we tend to stop doing the right things that lead us to success, and we might get sloppy in maintaining our good habits. Right? And if you're like me, and you have tried to lose weight before, you're probably familiar with these sloppy habits I'm talking about. We usually start off with strong zeal and hard work, and um, we'll probably start with working hard and, and dieting strictly for a few weeks, and we might lose a few kilos. We start to notice that our clothes are not as tight anymore, and you know the scales obviously show a few kilos that we've lost. But what often happens after that is that we start to make some allowances and compromises with our diets. If you know what I'm talking about, we have you know, a bit of KFC here and there, a bit of lollies and chips. And we, we, before we know it, the weight begins to creep back in, creep back in into our body. Right? And the more weight we put on, the more we feel guilty. And the more we feel guilty, the more junk food we would be eating. And it's a downward spiral. And we would fall into our old sloppy habits. We would lead us to failure. Now, it's the same with our relationship with the Lord. We've all probably heard the story of Samson. He's kind of the superhero in the Old Testament. He literally had superpower that God gave him. And he was mightily used by God to lead and defeat Israel, to defend Israel against the enemy of God. But over time, he too fell into sloppy habits. His lack of self-discipline and ignorance of key fundamentals of righteous living led him to his failure and even his death. In Exodus 3, verse 8, it says, So I have come down to rescue them from the, land, from the hand of the Egyptian and to bring them out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Parasites, Hephites, and Jebusites. Now, as Israelites left the wilderness behind, they were promised a prosperous future, 
God gave promise of the land that flows with milk and honey. And they were going to inherit the land which they did not work for. They would be residing in the cities that had not built. And they would eat from the land, the produce they neither plant, planted nor nurtured. And that's a very generous and fulfilling promises from the Lord. And we'll learn some lesson as we look back at Israel history and also our own when we think how God worked in our lives in the past. Many of us would quickly realize that the fulfillment of his promise is rarely immediate. That means God's promise are not instant. They don't happen straight away. And that's because we serve a God of process. While God's promises are abundant, many of them come with conditions that we must meet in order to receive their blessing. For example, in Proverbs 3, 5 to 6, it says, Trust in the Lord with all your hearts and lean out on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge or submit to him, and he will direct your path. And the promise he, that he will direct our path. And there's a condition, and that is we need to trust and submit to him first. Another example will be in Luke 6, 38. It says, give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be given to you. It's a generous promise. The promise is that he will bless us abundantly. And the condition is that we must first give to others before we can be blessed by the Lord. Now, of course, we don't give to gain back. It's not an investment. That is not the purpose here. We give because we have received so much from the Lord. And this gratitude fills our heart with love for him and for our neighbors. And so giving is our way of showing the love reflecting the generosity the Lord has shown us. And so when we give, we will be blessed by the Lord. And there's no other way around it. It's just a God, God's promise. He's very generous. So when we give, it's guaranteed that we will be blessed. And I certainly can testify about that in my life. And it takes faith to claim the promises of God. True faith is more than just lip service. True faith leads to obedience and loyalty to God while he's preparing us for the right time to receive that promise. So even in the meantime, when we're still waiting for the Lord, even in the meantime, when the promises of the Lord are not yet manifested, if we continue to obey and if we continue to be loyal and to be faithful to the Lord, it will come true. Let's read Joshua verse 24, uh, chapter 24, verse 1 to about 11. So bear with me here. Then Joshua assembled all the tribes of Israel at Sechem. He summoned the elders, leaders, judges, officials of Israel, and they presented themselves before the Lord. Joshua said to all the people, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Long ago your ancestors, including Terah, the father of Abraham and Nahor lived beyond the Euphrates River and worshipped other gods. But I took your father Abraham from the land beyond the Euphrates and led him throughout Canaan and gave him many descendants. I gave him Isaac, and to Isaac I gave Jacob and Esau. I assigned the whole country of Seir to Esau, but Jacob and his family went down to Egypt. Then I sent Moses and Aaron, and I afflicted the Egyptian by what I did there. And I brought you out when I brought your people out of Egypt. You came to the sea, and the Egyptians pursued them with chariots and horsemen as far as the Red Sea. But they cried to the Lord for help. And he put darkness between you and the Egyptian. He brought the sea over them and covered them. You saw with your own eyes what I did to the Egyptian. Then you lived in the wilderness for a long time. I brought you to the land of the Amorites who lived east of Jordan. They fought against you, but I gave them into your hands. I destroyed them from before you, and you took possession of their land. 
when Balak, the son of Zippor, and king of Moab, prepared to fight against Israel, he sent for Balaam, son of Beor, to put a curse on you. But I would not listen to Balaam. So he blessed you again and again, and I delivered you out of his hand. Then you crossed the Jordan and came to Jericho. The citizens of Jericho fought against you, as did also the Am Amorites, Parasites, Canaanites, Hittites, Gergesites, Hivites, and Jebusites. But I gave them into your hands. I sent the hornet ahead of you, which drove them out before you. Also the two Amorites king, you did not do it with your own sword and bow. I gave you the land on which you did not toil and cities you did not build. And you lived in them and eat from vineyard and olive groves that you did not plan. Protection and blessing of God to the Israelite. Joshua was speaking to the people in this story. He wanted to remind them of their ancestors' faith and perseverance in pursuing God's promise. He talked about Abraham, and he had so much faith in God that God took him out uh, from Ur the Chaldees to the land of Canaan and blessed him with many descendants. And then he spoke about Moses and Aaron and the Exodus and the miracles at the Red Sea, how he parted the Red Sea for Israel to walk through and buried the Egyptians under the water. And of course, all of them had heard these stories because it's such a, a, a significant story in the history. But not many had experienced the miracle firsthand because these are the second generation. They had not, they heard the stories, but Joshua wanted to paint a picture of how incredible and faithful God has been, had been to them. Joshua wanted the new generation to understand how much God had done for this people. He wanted them to know they had a special job to carry the legacy of faith. Just like their ancestors, they were called to trust in God, to see his promises come true in their own lives. He wanted them to share the testimony with the next generation. Now Joshua modeled this by sharing the testimony that he had. In 2 Peter 1, verse 4, it says, By which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through this you may be partaker of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. As Christian, the chosen people of the New Testament, God has given us exceedingly great and precious promise, right? Whether we have been Christians for a short period of time, six weeks or six decades, we have a testimony. And for some of us, this testimony could be deliverance from addictions, drugs, or alcohol. And for others, God deliver us from depressions and anxiety, while others, it might be healing or res restorations in our relationship with others. Each of us have testimonies of what God has done in our life and what God has carried us through. Now, like Joshua, our journey toward the promised land of God will not always be smooth. Right? There will be victories, there will be defeats, but as we continue walking by faith, we will see the promises of God begin to unfold in our lives. Now, for some of us, this include relational health as we live according to the principle of God and become more like Jesus. We can see that we start to change, we start to be transformed into the image of Christ. And during that transformation, we become more likable, we become more pleasant to be around. And so consequence, consequently, our relationship will, with others will improve and some of our past broken relationship might also be restored through this pursuit of living in holiness. Many of us experience financial stability as we obey, obey God's commandment to become good steward of his blessing. Now, I know looking back 2010, I, I was broke until I was saved. So this is 
also my testimony, as soon as I walk in the way of the Lord, my financial situation came together. And God promises of peace and joy will also manifest in our life, improving our mental and emotional wellness as we learn not to fear and to cast our cares on Jesus. For most of us, our testimony have come through battles. We have experienced many challenges. We may have lost some battles. We may even bear some scars. But if we are actively living by faith and persistently moving forward, we will have a testimony of God and his provision and his faithfulness. Our testimonies are powerful. And the testimony that we have are meant to be shared and guarded. They will bring strength and hope, not only to us when we recall them, when we remember them, but also to others as we share them. At the next verse in the same account, Joshua commanded the Israelites to get rid of their idols. Now Joshua urged Israel, Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth, and put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt, and serve ye the Lord. Although the children of Israel were the chosen people of God, Israel still had idols from their past. Hundreds of, hundreds of years after God called Abraham, his descendants were still struggling to surrender those idols from their past. Not only that, they may have even adopted the worship of some of the Egyptian gods while Israel was in bondage, about 400 years in Egypt. If you perhaps remember the story when Aaron fashioned a golden calf at the foot of Mount Sinai, and there was the manifestation of the God of Egypt as a, as a golden calf, and they carried those, those culture and those gods of the, of the land of Egypt through with them. As Christians, we must be very careful not to embrace the God of our culture and our past. And I want to make that, uh, say that again. As Christians, we must be very, very careful not to embrace gods of our culture and our past. We must never become divided in our loyalty or devotion to the Lord. We must hear and heed the first words God spoke to Moses. It says, I am the Lord thy God, which hath brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Now, in Old Testament, Egypt speaks about sin. And so, for us, God is reminding us here in the New Testament that, we sh that he, he, he is the God who delivered us from sin, and we should not have any other God but him. So be careful of idol, such as the love of money, entertainment, sensual pleasure, that often secretly carried along with us toward the promise of God. Without knowing, without we realize, we carry along those idols in our lives. And as Joshua urged the Israelites to serve God with sincerity and completeness and turn aside from their false God, God voices, God voice echoes into 21st century, into our, our life today. It says, serve me with completeness and turn aside from false God that distract and hinder you. Amen. Now the next portion of that scripture, of that story, Joshua then challenged the people to serve the Lord. In verse 15 it says, But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourself this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Joshua challenged those he addressed as he drew the line in the sand. He gave them three choices. You serve the God of Abraham, which is Yahweh. Serve the false God of Abraham's ancestors or the God of the land in which they now lived. 
Joshua's point was very clear. It was time to decide. And for many years, Israel had made decisions based on groupthink that allowed them to escape individual responsibilities. You know, they murmured together, they went to war together, they worshipped the golden calf together, doubted together, etc. Joshua decided that they had to stop that, and everyone had to decide for themselves at that time. Joshua 24, verse 15 said, Choose you this day whom you will serve. And this is true in our lives now. No matter what others do, we must make a personal commitment to lead ourselves and our homes in the ways of God. I mean, attending church together and doing things together with the body of Christ is important. And we don't want to stop doing that. But we must make a personal choice to serve the Lord regardless of what other peoples are doing, right? Even if others may begin to bow to idols, or worldly values, or selfishness, or lust, etc., we have the responsibility to make a personal choice to serve the Lord and lead our family also to serve the Lord. In Joshua 24, 15, as we read before, Joshua said, But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua's challenge to the Israelites was bold and direct. And so was his answer to his own challenge. He had seen Israelites' proclivity to unfaithfulness. He knew the double-mindedness still present in some Israelites. So he challenged them to choose. But before giving them the chance even to answer, Joshua boldly declared, as we read before, as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Joshua knew who his God was. He and his family would wholeheartedly serve the Lord. Like the Israelite today, we are too left to answer that big question. Who will we serve? The time for wavering is over now. What will your answer be tonight? Will it be demonstrated in your walk? Will it be demonstrated in how you talk? Our choice will always be followed by our action. Our action truly testify what choice we made. So there are two components there. That's what, that, that our confession and also our conduct. As the redeemed children of God, we will experience opposition and attacks from the enemy. And that can be expected. We will have to fight hard battles. The Bible says we are fighting the good fight of faith. We must conquer enemies of carnal appetites of lust, greed, and worldliness. And God called us to walk by faith in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 7. Faith, when you break it down in its simplest form, it is simply complete trust in and obedience to God and his word no matter the outlook. I repeat, faith in its simplest form is complete trust in and obedience to God and His Word, no matter the outlook. Paul wrote to the church in Rome and declared, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, The just shall live by faith. In Romans 1 verse 17. God's righteousness is ultimately revealed when we, who have been justified by faith, proceed to live by faith. So when we have been justified by our faith in the Lord, we then proceed and go ahead and live in obedience through faith. We live from faith to faith. We must always be grateful for and celebrate our past victories achieved through faith. God's promises achieved through faith are worth of, worthy of celebration. But we must keep the finish line in sight because we're not there yet. While it's important to celebrate past victories and past deliverance, we got to keep our eyes to the finish line. Our race is not completely run. The final bell of the fight of fate has yet to ring. We must take 
the fight seriously until the very end. The Bible says, But he who endures till the end shall be saved. In Matthew 24, 24 verse 13. And it is a personal decision to serve the Lord. But it's also a daily decision. No matter what's happening around us, we've got to keep choosing God. Because in the end, that's the only choice that matters. We've got to keep our eyes on Jesus. He has given us promises. He has proven us that he's faithful. And as we look back, we could see his hand worked in our lives. And we have that assurance of the future if we keep our eyes on Jesus. Now, just to close this message, I would like to read this um, uh, closing stories. On April 11, 2015, at Hayward Field in Eugene, Oregon, hopeful athletes meet to run in the Pepsi Team Invitational Track Meet. The crowd of over 3,000 roared as the contestants in the 3,000 meter steeplechase raced toward the finish line. The steeplechase combines different skill into one race, distant running, hurdling, and long jumping. Runners must clear 28 hurdles and seven water jumps along the nearly two mile long course. Interestingly, the steeple chase originated in England when people raced from one church steeple to the next. The steeples were used as marked due to their high visibility. Runners encountered streams and stone walls while running between towns, which is why the hurdles and water jumps are now included. During the steeple chase on April 11, 2015, Oregon Tengai Pepiot, a senior from France, had a commanding lead as he approached the final 100 meters. In mind, victory was sealed. He was so confident that he began waving his arm for the crowd to cheer louder. Unfortunately for Pepiot, no one informed the University of Washington's Marin Simon that the race was over. As Pepiot urged the crowd to cheer louder for his sure victory, he smiled as he heard them respond. It was only fitting. Pepiot was a student athlete at the University of Oregon, and this race was being held on his home track. But he did not realize that the crowd's heightened cheers was not celebrating him. They were urging him to stay focused as Simon repeatedly closed in on the outside. By the time Pepiot realized what was happening, Simon crossed the finish line and won by a foot with the time of 8.57.86 compared to 8.57.96 for Pepiot. Pepiot lost the race after he broke one of the key rules in sports by celebrating before he won. A look of shock and dismay broke across his face as Simon passed him at the finish line by tenth one hundredth of a second. I heard some noise, Pepiot explained. I was very surprised. Then I checked the screen and I was like, whoa, someone's coming. Simon explained. I thought he had me. I thought he was just so far ahead. Then I heard the crowd get crazy and he started throwing his hands up. I was like, I don't think he knows I'm coming. I just went to the line and just raced. Our race of faith also begins at a steeple, a local church. Our race is filled with many obstacles and pitfalls to overcome. It is long and tiring, but we have inside another steeple or pinnacle. It is the eternity, the city of New Jerusalem. As we near the finish line of this race, we must stay engaged and focus on the finishing well. We cannot afford to be distracted so near the end of our race. Amen. Well, I hope this lesson has been a blessing and a, a reminder to us that we need to keep our eyes on Jesus. Don't fall into sloppy habits. Continue to be strong in faith. Continue to pursue him and in relationship with him. Choose, as Joshua said, as for me 
and my house, we will serve the Lord. God bless you.